Hello everyone, welcome. My name is James Harding. I'm uh, one of the editors and one of the founders here. Uh, one of my fellow founders, Matthew Barson, is with us as well. This evening, uh, I'm going to hand over in a moment to Kerry Thomas, um, to my mind, the best editor that the BBC Today programme ever had. He went on to become the editor of Panorama, uh, and after a short stint at Oxford <coughs> University, is now here as one of the editors of Tortoise. I'm going to hand this thorny issue over to <laughs> Kerry in a moment. Before I do, I just wanted to say two things. One, very practical, and the other, God help you, rather philosophical. The, the practical is, we started uh, just over two weeks ago now uh, in beta. We are a, a new newsroom, and this is our test phase, and we're trying out a host of different things. We're trying out ways that we publish stories, ways that we commission stories, but most importantly, the ways in which we discuss what's happening in the news and seek to get better informed. And this, our thinking, is the engine of our journalism. It's an attempt to try and garner the opinions, the experiences of people who have expertise, enthusiasm, energy around a subject, so that we can produce journalism <coughs> that is more insightful, that is better informed. So the starting point is, please make sure that you tell us what you think. Tell us your experiences. Make sure that that drives us both in reporting terms but also in our thinking. In order to develop it in such a way that those of us who are lucky enough can come and be part of the conversation in the room, that our thinkings are not just limited to that. We're trying to develop a format that also works on film. So, as you will see, there is a handsome and groovy man in the corner wearing a band that is Richard. We've just begun to treat our newsroom as a studio. So we're just experimenting with how we film the thinking. So you'll see there are a number of cameras around the room, and we're looking to see how do we do that and edit, whether it's long or short. So if you're wondering what these uh, strange things are hanging down, those are our microphones, uh, these are the cameras. And we're just beginning to examine how that could work in film. So thank you for helping us to learn as we go. The thing I wanted to say to you philosophically was this. Uh, a number of people uh, in this room, not least my co-founder Katie Bank smith talked for a long time not just about how you set up a new model in journalism, commercially, but what does it mean intellectually? What's the idea? And in the year or so, probably longer, that we were thinking about this, one of the things that kept frustrating us was there was not an easy bumper sticker to reach for. There's not, at this stage, in our politics, an easy ism that you can say, we're with the socialists, the nationalists, the conservatives, the liberals. None of those isms feel as though they are up to the problems of our times. And you're either deeply dispirited by that idea, by the realization that the pace and depth of changes that we're dealing with means that our politics feels inadequate to those problems, or you are, and this is in the spirit of tortoise, <coughs> deeply energized by that. You think that in the absence of a bumper sticker, actually the only sensible thing is for us to do the work, is try to examine issue by issue, problem by problem, and try to come to a set of answers that make sense given the complexity of each of these issues. And from there, perhaps over time, we'll come to a coherent body of thought but one that's driven by evidence and experience. And so when we set out two weeks ago what we were for, one of the things we were for was trying to grapple with some of the more complicated and controversial issues that we, if you like, stub our toes on every day. And gambling is one. Gambling is one that gives a huge number of people a huge amount of enjoyment, and it is also creating extraordinary and exceptional social and personal problems. And so we thought this would be the right kind of issue for us to spend some time thinking through and trying to understand. And so we hope that over the course of the next hour or so, led by Kerry Thomas, you all will help us come to a deeper understanding and a better informed point of view on Gavin. Okay, over to you. Thank you. So James, this is all the fun. I get to do the rules. Does anyone? <coughs> the one rule now is that there are no questions. So, so this is an attempt to take the, the central moment in the news day, the newspaper, or the BT, or ISTG, which is the sort of 
the, the, the editorial meeting, the editorial conference, and to open that up to, to, to expertise and to, to people who care about what we're doing. Um, but this is not a panel show. So we, whatever you do, we don't want questions. We want knowledge. We want expertise. We want experience, but not, not questions. And we'll be quite tough on that. The only other rule is when that little tortoise up there gets to the end of that race, a flag will go up and we will stop. And it'll be about 7.15, so keep your eye on it. If you think you want to ask something and you haven't asked it, then, um, then get a move on. Um, we had a thinking last week uh, about cannabis. And it was fascinating because it turned out that either members of Tortoise are a, a bunch of stoners mm. or, um, or they're liberal progressives who, who don't believe in prohibition didn't overly believe in regulation. The mood of the room was quite clear that uh, it wanted moves towards the legalization of cannabis as quickly as possible. And I think it's quite interesting to think about the analogies and the overlaps between that debate uh, and the kind of stuff we're going to be talking about tonight. Are we going to find that this room is as liberal as opposed to regulation on the question of gambling as that one was on the question of <coughs> drugs. I just don't know. Part of the fascination is I'm looking forward to finding out. A um, couple of people next to me. Let me start with Dr. Henrietta Bowden-Jones, consultant psychiatrist who works in the field of addiction and in that capacity comes across gambling increasingly, I see. Uh, yes, I run the National Problem Gambling Clinic. That would help. I spend exactly. my life treating gamblers at the moment, yes. And Matt Zarb cousin who uh, has worked in politics but now is a founder and chief exec of a piece of software called Gamban that allows people who think they have a problem with gambling to put a technological barrier between them and the thing that's, uh, that's troubling them. That's right, yeah. yeah. Um, as James said, we want to hear from as many people in the room as possible. Sometimes we hear from literally everybody. That's when we feel like we've had a really good night. Um, let me, can I start with you, Matt? Because I know that one of the things that's taken you into <coughs> your current field of work it was personal experience. So can you just tell us what it was that, 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 that happened to you? Sure. OK. So I started gambling at 16, uh, which was I was underage. I went in a betting shop and on fixed odds betting terminals. And obviously, when you start gambling, you don't set out to become addicted. You want to gamble responsibly. Uh, such a thing exists. And uh, Obviously, I, I, in, the, in the first instance, you know, I was gambling one, two pound a spin or whatever. And these are machines that allow you to stake up to 100 every 20 seconds. And in the first few weeks of like sort of playing them every, occasionally, I, I won about 700 pounds. Obviously, that felt like an astronomical amount of money, particularly at my age. Um, and then very quickly became addicted to them and felt as though I needed to be in the betting shop all the time. Uh, and it was like a physiological addiction. So I felt if I wasn't, if I wasn't doing it, I was thinking about it. It completely like took over my life for four years. And I got into a huge amount of debt, about 15 grand of debt, and uh, lost a hell of a lot of money. And yeah, it impacted my life in other ways as well. I think people often dwell on the losses, but it's not the losses really that are sort of where the, where the most harm is a lot of the time is the, the time it takes, the, um, almost the, the obsession that you have with it uh, and the rapid highs and lows and the kind of how it affects your mental health in the long term. There's lots of things that um, that's associated with it. And you think, how is this possible? This is only, this isn't a substance. This is only a, uh, an activity. It's a game. Um, the best way of describing it is like, I don't know if anyone plays sport, and uh, so if you play football and you score a goal and you get an adrenaline rush, or you make a save playing goal and you get an adrenaline rush, it's like that, but you're sitting down in a chair every 20 seconds. And the anticipation between spins is where the addiction is. It's like you feel like a real rush. Uh, that you chase, you chase that feeling, and you chase, and and when you when you start losing because you've won before, you convince yourself you can win it back, and there's a delusion that's involved, and it's very unique in the sense that because I like your comparison with drugs, it's very unique in the sense that 
gambling, <coughs> the gambling addict can delude themselves quite easily into believing that carrying on with the thing that they're addicted to is going to solve all the problems that the addiction has caused. And by that I mean they can delude themselves into believing that if they win all the money back that they've lost, all the problems that gambling, the gambling addiction has caused them will be solved. Um, that isn't true, obviously, because if you want it all back somehow, you would just carry on gambling because you're addicted to it. That is what they tell themselves, and it's very easy to believe that. Whereas with drugs, no drug addict can really believe that taking drugs, taking more and more drugs all the time is going to solve all the problems that the drug addiction has caused. Um, that said, I don't think <coughs> gambling should be prohibited. Uh, it should be legal and regulated. But it shouldn't be liberalised. If we, if we legalised drugs, we wouldn't advertise them on telly, we, you know, as we do with gambling. So if there were parity, uh, you know, if, 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 sort of if uh, <coughs> gambling, uh, gambling was not liberalised but mm -hmm. still legal and drugs were legalised and regulated, I, I would understand that. I think they should be treated the same. OK. I thought you were going to go somewhere else because you said gambling responsibly if such a thing exists, but in the end, you well, believe that such a thing does exist, yes? Well, I, I, don't, I, I don't really... I think the responsible gambling paradigm isn't very helpful because it's been very useful for the industry to devolve all of the responsibility for uh, gambling-related harm onto an individual and say, the reason that you're experiencing harm is because you are not responsible. I think it's very dangerous because some products are more addictive than others. And they're, I mean, the, the, it's often said that, OK, it's only about 1% of the population that has a gambling addiction. But if you look at the product by product, so for fixed odds betting terminals, it's 43% of people that experience problems that, that use fixed odds betting terminals. Um, I was sat on a panel with the CEO of Mr. Green, which is an online gambling company, uh, in Brussels recently. And uh, I made the point that PricewaterhouseCoopers research for GambleAware found that basically 60% of the losses are coming from people with gambling problems online, 60%. And the guy, the CEO from Mr. Green said, yeah, that's about 15% of our customers. So 15% of the customer base of these companies is, ga is a gambling addicts. And you think that's not really a sustainable business model. Uh, and they're contributing more than half of the, of the losses. Yeah. One of the <coughs> things I was keen to to understand from you is whether, is there any medical debate about whether this should be treated as a, a, as a medical problem, as, a, as, a, as an addiction like any other? Well, uh, 10 years on from when I first opened the National Problem Gambling Clinic, which is the only uh, NHS clinic uh, designated to the treatment of pathological gamblers, I'm glad to say that this issue is not, no longer an issue. But I still remember uh, during uh, Tony Blair's times, when he was thinking about the super casino and the extra casinos and the media were interested and I was fending off the calls on behalf of the Royal College of Psychiatrists, I still remember uh, people saying to me, well, Henrietta, if, you're going, if you are going to set up a clinic, you might as well do it in your, um, on your Thursday afternoon, your CPD afternoon. And I said, yeah, yeah, you're probably right. I'll probably only get about three or four, three or four <laughs> people a week at the maximum. Um, anyway, as it turns out, um, I've had thousands and thousands and thousands of people, and every week I have at least 40 people asking for help, and that's without letting anyone know we even exist. Um, so what we know is there are just under half a million problem gamblers in this country, and only 8,000 are in treatment. So there's a big gap in relation to that. There are many more people who need treatment. However, many, many more people than that gamble. You know, England is a nation of gamblers, has always been, and the prevalence is just under 1%. So that's just to put it into context for you. Um, some people's brains are very vulnerable to becoming excited by the idea of winning or losing. Uh, this is uh, apparent in many of our patients from a very young age. They're eight, nine, ten years old, and they are gambling on anything they can. We know that with all addictions, there's a 50% heritability factor. So we know we that half of our patients have relatives who are pathological gamblers. Um, the interesting thing is that when I used to run the drugs and alcohol ward and did heroin detoxes, alcohol detoxes, it was uh, addiction in general that was the, it was a genetic predisposition. Whereas with these patients, they have gambling in the family. It seems to be a kind of pure behavioral addictions um, sort of path they're taking. And 
It, 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 there is no question now, either at, at this country's level or indeed globally, um, problem gambling is included in the, um, in the two manuals, medical manuals, as an illness. And we treat it as such. Um, one of the greatest victories a few years ago was uh, when I managed to persuade my NHS trust to allow me to prescribe uh, medication for the 20% of people we were seeing who were treatment resistant to the very good psychological treatment we deliver that normally sorts, normally sorts the problem out. These 20% were still suicidal, they were still unable to get their lives back on track and using naltrexone has allowed us to treat a significant number more. And this goes back to the idea of this what is a vulnerable brain. Um, people who, with gambling problems are more impulsive. We know this from many, many neuropsych neuropsychological <coughs> tests that we've done. Uh, people with gambling problems are less able to make good decisions in relation to postponing gratification. Well, you can see how, you know, when you go back to Matt's story, this is going to cause you problems because instead of doing your homework, or instead of studying for your degree, and by the way, I have a lot of students who come in who've dropped out of university, you're playing poker all night, or you're on the machines, or now you're online roulette playing. Um, and that makes things difficult. There's a, there are certain, what there is, are certain parts of the brain that form a, a reward pathway. It's called the dopaminergic reward pathway. And they are faulty in a certain number of people who... If these people don't encounter gambling, if they're not primed into it as children with lots of games that give you kind of rushes if you're playing, you, they may never come across the idea of gambling uh, as, as a hobby, which then could become pathological. But the truth is uh, that some people will be very predisposed to it. OK, um, so we've heard a sort of personal testimony and, and the big picture. Um, but as Henrietta said, we are, we're a determined people. So, can I just sort of ask the room? I'm just interested to know how many people here have gambled in some way or other in, let's say, the last six months. You should put your hands up if you have. How about the last 24 hours? <laughs> how about the last 24 hours? How about the last year? That would be interesting. Okay, and the last year, Henrietta's saying? Okay, so we're sort of... Yeah, that's about right for the country. Just 60%. So, uh, 70%. 70%, 70%, 70%, 70%, 70%, 70%, 70%, 70%, 70%, 70%, 70%, 70%, 70%, 70%, 70%, 70%, 70%, 70%, 70%, 70%, 70%, 70%, 70%, 
they'll put their hands up and talk about gaming. And it's exactly the same folks who get the same adrenaline rush that's been described, whether they're playing shoot up videos all night, whether they're gambling, gaming on eBay, whether they're, re they're responding to their loyalty to the local football team. It's the same adrenaline rush. You're, you're, the problems that will accrue if you're uh, in relationship problems from gambling are the same if you're playing up, shooting up videos all night, your partner's the same responsibility. So when you ask for a show of hands, if you said how many people have been <coughs> gaming all night, whether you're three-year-olds playing Angry Birds or 65-year-olds in a casino, <coughs> it's a continuum, it's not a dichotomy, gaming and gambling, it's a... Okay. It's a it's but are you saying this, without the financial harm, it's still the same? It's the same rush. Why? It's the same rush. Because whether you're playing for points for your avatar, playing somebody to beat somebody up on this, whether it's the loyalty when you tear up your local football team with their close Wi-Fi games that you feel... Okay. Same rush, but is it the same harm if it goes wrong? Oh, of course it is. Absolutely. It's, just, it's the same relationship. It may not be the only financial harm, but the same relationship harm if you're up all night playing shoot up videos. It's the same thing. Sorry, I will shut up. No, 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 come on. It's, it's correct, because um, Belgium have just recently banned uh, what's called loot boxes. And loot boxes are... Um, so, for example, one very popular game is FIFA Ultimate Team. So you buy the game, play FIFA, go online, and then if you want to add players to your team, you have to buy a loot box. And in a loot box, you, you purchase the loot box and you don't know what's inside. And it could be like whatever, say, for example, it's five pounds. Um, you might get Cristiano Ronaldo in one in a thousand boxes, or you might just get loads of non-league players. You don't know what you're going to get, so it's a gamble. Um, but because you don't know, they don't know what the return to player is, so you could end up spending five hundred pounds before you get a half decent player. Uh, it, it, Belgium decided this is the same as gambling because you are actually spending money. You don't know what you're going to get, and what you get is something of value to the player. So yeah, I, I agree. It's the same. <laughs> Let me, I'll just come to the audience and then I'll come back to you. Yeah. Um, so I did learn it, I cited it better. Um, let me just take oh, your... Sorry, Tessa and Murray. Um, I don't think there's probably much debate in the room about whether addictive behaviour around gambling is a good or a bad thing, or that in any um, industry as to, like tobacco, alcohol, gambling, you know, the three men in the apocalypse industries I've probably represented in my time at some point or other, um, that these are threats and risks to individuals. I think the more interesting question I'd really like to hear about is, you know, I'm a massive liberal with, you know, capital L, which is as long as you, uh, you can do anything you want, as long as you, you know, you, you accept the risk and you, you, you are um, not harming others. And therefore the challenge to the industry is how can you create that leisure experience? How can you create an engaging experience whilst putting the right protections? And just think about you walking to a betting shop when you're 16 and play on a clock. You can walk in and rent a video without two forms of ID at Blockbuster back in the day. Yeah. So why isn't why aren't we as an industry doing everything we can to make everything account based, everything um, identity checked? You know, there are so many issues that feed into um, what the industry can do not only to protect itself but protect its its customers and to protect sport and keep it clean. You know, we haven't touched on the anti-corruption benefits of knowing who your customers are. So I think I think I don't think anyone would argue against the risk of gambling. But I think there's a I'd really like to hear so I'm not allowed to ask questions. <coughs> in theory, I'd really like to hear what the technology that you see coming, the, the, the way that we can use technology to anticipate behavioural trends and, and people's betting patterns, how can we get more predictive, use AI, yada yada yada. Yeah, uh, let's come to that. Henry will be trying to jump in, but I, I also want to pick up, Tessa, on whether it's a technologically a fair fight still between gamblers and the gambling companies. Because one of the things that seems to me has changed a lot is that there is an awful lot of computing power and, uh, and behavioural insight on the side of the gambling companies that wasn't there when I was young. And, and does that skew the equation? But, let, but it's um, an opportunity as well, Carrie, though. Yeah, it's I can see that. It's a huge opportunity for, for both partners in, in, the, <coughs> in gambling. Yeah. So, so I, I wrote a, a piece at the FT a couple of weeks ago in a column about fighting tech with tech, exactly about this. Um, I'll, I'll try and summarise it in, in one minute, but essentially what I'm saying in that piece is that uh, changes have occurred that have allowed us to uh, help our patients uh, man maintain abstinence from gambling through what is called in the business stimulus control, essentially 
it's making it impossible for them to give in to their cravings and urges by using technology. The, the, by far the greatest thing, and it's, it's just a chance coincidence Matt is sitting here because I do talk about this in any case, uh, Gamban has allowed us to protect our patients by blocking any access to gambling related material, not just on devices, but also on phones. Just imagine when I started this clinic, this didn't exist. Uh, they could self-exclude, but of course they often didn't, and then they started with a new ID and new name and all that. So this has been a tremendous um, movement towards uh, allowing people who make a decision to actually carry that decision through. Remember, these are impulsive people who think the right thing, and that two minutes later they've decided against it. But in this case, you can't. And the second thing, then I'll hand over, um, is the introduction by Monzo of this incredible bank card, which we have been begging for for a long time. But I, you know, I'm not technological enough to have created it, but someone did it for us. They came to the clinic, we talked at length about what we needed, uh, including uh, not only a complete ban on spending on anything to do with gambling that you, the user, could use instead of having that embarrassing discussion with your local branch at your bank, which no one wanted to have, but a very interesting 48-hour uh, pause between your decision to revert your decision to protect yourself and your family from bankruptcy um, and the uh, ability to access the cash because most gamblers in that 48 hours regret that decision, and by then they don't want that anymore. And it's made an enormous difference. I'll shut up. There's not by some miracle anybody from Monzo in the room, is there? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. do, do you know any more about the... Yeah, it's the invent team, the it's team that Perfect. So yeah. just give us your name as well. Stuart McFadden uh, from Monzo. Um, yeah, so we, we implemented it because um, part of my team's responsibility is to... Um, just inform features that help people manage their money. Um, it's actually the, what we call the vulnerable customer team. Um, and in the early days, before we were lending, uh, the thing that we would see repeatedly and the thing that people would ask for most commonly would be a block on gambling. Um, can you block me from being able to do this and that? And like, you'd see lots of things come through customer support where people are like disputing transactions. So, like, I know, like, this wasn't me, and then they're saying it's like 200 pounds to Coral. And you see they've used Coral for like, the last like six months, yeah. um, and just like there was obviously it was obviously a big risk <coughs> for our customers. Um, so we just saw that as we spoke to a few charities, and then they got some advice on the best thing to do, and that's where we came up with this friction thing, and we just put it in place. Um, it's been a massive success, obviously. Uh, lots of people use it. It's like over fifty thousand people that use it now, and we only have about we have like a million or so customers. A lot of those people... And is it a reason why people might come to Monzo yeah. in the first place? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, like, that's... Because at the moment, it's a shame it's, <laughs> this isn't a few weeks later because we're going through an exercise at the moment where we're just looking at all the data and everything um, and trying to pull out some insights as to how it's actually working and what behaviours are changing. Like, early indications are... When we've spoken to people, about 15% of people that are actually putting the block on identify as problem gamblers. Um, and around 50% of those people have never spoken to anyone before about their problem. Um... And early indications are that like it's working obviously because gambling stops once it's added, and but people withdraw more cash <coughs> instead. But that might be because they have more money now. We don't know. Okay. Uh, so it'd, it'd be interesting to see what comes out of like yes. yeah. okay. um, Praha, you've had your hand up, yeah. Um, yeah, I think um, the point that the gentleman at the front made about um, like FIFA and Ultimate Team um, just come out of university, so I can relate to that a lot. And if you'd ask me. Um, do I, have I gambled? No, I haven't. But I've played that game and I've opened packs. So technically I have. So I think the definition is really important. For example, like my dad, who's never drunk, gambled, that kind of thing. But he worked as a trader at a major bank for like 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> if, you are, if I asked him, he'd be like, of course not. I've never gambled. <laughs> but of course he has. So I think the, the definition of Someone it. else's money, I think. <laughs> that helps. <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, actually, putting something at stake in the hope of gaining something of greater value, that's yeah. a very helpful yeah. definition, because it does... I guess when people think of gambling, they just think of sort of blackjack, poker, that kind of thing. But, mm -hmm. you know, things like FIFA and, and finance and that kind of thing are could potentially be included in that, in that definition. Yeah. So you've had your hand up. Yeah, I just wanted to make a point. Sorry, can I just get your name as well? Stephen Lloyd. I just wanted to make a point. I think that you perhaps underestimate in this discussion 
of gambling as a problem, the intellectual aspect of it. For example, I don't know how many people play backgammon. It's a question of analysis. And if you play backgammon with, say, 30 people at a private club or what have you, it's a question of using the doubling dice. It's a question of counting where the men are at a various time. It's very analytical. When you look at who wins the major backgammon championships in the world, it's normally a, a don at Oxford or something like that. Also, the point the lady made, the first speaker, in terms of racing. This is an analytical exercise. Even if you may lose, if you look at handicaps, you're looking at a series of things. You're looking at weights. You're looking at what the, the nature of the weather is at the time. You're looking at the jockey. You look, for example, to see how the trainers kept the weights mm -hmm. over a period of time. It's very much analysis. So you say that there are a certain number of problem gamblers. Of course there are. But you need to understand that for many people, the intellectual aspect of it is absolutely fascinating. I, I, I do I do understand and, and actually interestingly, apart from being a great fan of backgammon, I've never <laughs> encountered a pathological gambler playing backgammon. <laughs> I'm sure there are some out there, but I've never met We're them. Too and and, and <laughs> equally, e equally, may I just mention the horse racing. Horse racing is something that people with problems may have done in the past, but it's not fast enough. We're talking about, you know, twenty second in that point. So so the times and I have, of course, met several. When I have met people with a, with a pathological gambling focusing on horse racing, it's often been people who have been brought up in families where horse racing, horse racing is a family business and they have a genetic predisposition to problems and to interest in, interest in this area. I think the speed of repeat is a really important <coughs> point, and yeah. that's why the, the change of the poverty <coughs> stakes didn't actually address that, which yeah. I think was a shame. OK, let me come to the gentleman there, and then I'll keep going. <coughs> just yes, referring to your point, Brian is my name, Brian, Brian. Sweet, and just referring to your point on technology and its two, two problems. One, you were asking, is um, how the odds stacked against you know, because technology, they can work out the odds, etc., very quickly, but I think the gentleman here will tell you, <coughs> You know, the competition has never been greater and the overall has never been less. The, the gambler is getting the best odds ever because through Betfair and through many other, you know, the competition is much greater. But then on the second point of technology, and it comes back to the example of Monzo and, you know, the app, your best chance of recognizing pathological behavior is all there in their accounts. And once regulation decides to embrace that, I think that we have every chance. There's a lot of positivity around gambling and the gambling industry and the employment, etc. Um, but there, you know, the negativity that we associated with it can ease, not easily, but with the right efforts can can be addressed. Okay, but well, I think we've got an interesting couple of tracks emerging. So, that, so there's a, there's a line of argument which is coming out, which is saying there are technological solutions, Monzo, Gamban, which which can help offset the effects of a technology which, through high repeats and through migrating to different platforms, has become more present in our... So there's a sort of technology versus, versus technology argument that's coming out. There's also a kind of argument, I think, which we haven't quite got to yet, about whether the 2005 Act, whether that liberalisation itself was a mistake and whether we need to, to row back on that. But I hope we'll come to that later. But let me... So, John, you've had your hand up and then James. It's just like that. <laughs> 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 racing is okay. Have you ever walked into a sports betting arena in Kuala Lumpur, Singapore, where the walls are full of TV sets where you can base on every horse racing event in from New Zealand to Bukima Faso? Who's going to be third, second, fourth? Mm, first, I agree. I agree with you. It, it, it's, it's, it's not so okay for people with some, problems. Some sports are okay yeah. and some are no, no, you can yeah. bet on who's the next car that's going to walk along that road. No, I, I fully so agree with you. Don't, don't misunderstand me. I, I, I fully agree with you. And there are plenty of pathological gamblers, just that less that than the are, others. I'm sorry to interrupt you. Excuse me, that's very rude. Forgive me. There's an argument <laughs> in, in the UK that says, I've heard it, that we have to allow certain uh, latitude, certain um, leeway <coughs> to the um, horse racing um, industry in the UK, because unless we allow gaming for the horse racing, that, that industry will collapse. 
okay, let's liberalise drugs because it's exactly the same argument. Yeah. No, I'm with you on that. I, I, you, I don't disagree with you. you. I don't want we you are to misunderstand. Drugs, so people, well, well, people want to be free to do their, thing, their thing. So sorry, I was forgive me. Sorry. Okay. It's like there is, no, there is but you cannot say it's gaming, it's gambling. It doesn't matter whether it's on cockroaches walking on windows, yeah, absolutely. horses, or. Yeah, but what I will say, and I have you know, 10,000 patients to speak about, because that's what I've seen, uh, I will tell you that horse racing is not in contemporary Britain the thing that attracts problem gamblers. It is roulette games, and it is sports betting of a faster in-match in kind of betting, and you know, that's based on evidence. Okay, I'm going to go to James, and then Rob, and then there's a hand up there as well, and one behind. So James first. I just, I'm going to fall into your trap, Kerry, of being a Puritan stoner. Right? So <laughs> Liberalised cannabis, clamp down on gambling arguments. So I, yeah. I, I worry about <coughs> the extent to which we fall into a narrow argument around problem gambling without getting into the broader argument that gambling is a problem. Right? So I, I don't see the arguments for gambling in society more broadly. I could see the arguments for saying, OK, let's allow people to bet at the horse races or let's operate a certain number of casinos. But the, the problem, it seems to me, with the 2005 Act is, to Matt's point at the outset, is that we didn't legalise gambling. We liberalised it at a level that was, was like nothing else in the rest of the world. And, and the thing that strikes me about the notes here is that the, the consequences of it are, A, we're dealing with huge concentrations of wealth and power in the hands of these gambling companies. Right? So they're taking a far, far, far larger share of the wallet. I'm afraid, Rob, I don't buy the argument that this is hugely improved or enhanced the experience of sports fans. Actually, I think that Sky itself did a great deal on that front, but I'm not sure that, that betting organisations have done that. And, and if you believe that gambling is of itself regressive, that actually it takes the money out of the pockets of people who often can't afford it, then there's a problem with gambling itself, not just for addicts, but for, but for so many people who, who make use of gambling services. Yeah, and if you get a chance to look at the notes that we've given, the, the, the rise in gambling since, even since 2008, so not in the immediate aftermath of the 2005 Act, which was the Great Liberalisation, has been incredibly stark, hasn't it? Can, can um, we just be careful on some of the stats? Because, yeah. you know, the, the number... The, Participation in gambling in the UK has actually fallen in the last few years. The proportion of the population that gambles in the year has fallen. The proportion of people that bet online is around 10%. It's been fairly stable for the last three or four years. Um, yes, there are companies uh, that have made a huge amount of money, um, but it um, has not been a sort of an epic sea change. Uh, in, in fortunes over the last few years, which so just need to be careful. Well, the house for the that. companies, isn't it? For a lot of the companies, companies, there has been yes. an epic sea change. And, and predominantly, the switch really oh. from retail and other so forms online. of gambling to online, so, which means there's been some very, very big, big winners there mm. in, in, in particular. But you know, we can't get away from the fact that so, so gambling is not hugely growing in the UK. Uh, much you might read differently. Um, but you also can't ignore the fact that lots of people gamble, they must enjoy it for whatever reason. For me it might be enhancing my enjoyment of watching a football game. For other people it may be the, the thrill, it may be the chance of winning some money of course. So, you know, I think we, we, it's very dangerous to prohibit or talk about prohibiting something that is incredibly popular and people enjoy a lot. And of course the vast majority without any harm. And vast majority without risk of harm too. But of course, you know, um, there are a number of people that get into serious difficulty and we should never, you know, that's, that's not good enough. We should always pursue to reduce the problem gambling. Yeah, and I think we're probably not talking about prohibiting, are we? I no. suspect we're... we're the, well, I wasn't we're, sure James's mm. voice was <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I, It wasn't quite the same. I took it as a devil's advocate thing rather than a hard can line. I just but... make, can I just make one more point on yeah. technology and then I will shut up? Um, it is also beholden on the gambling operator who does have, I think the gentleman over there mentioned it, a huge amount of data at their disposal to monitor on a daily basis uh, their customer base, really understand and know their customer. Uh, the wonders of um, data science and enough uh, nerds in a room that are monitoring customers, setting up alerts for unusual behaviours, fresh behaviours, accelerating betting uh, trends within an individual 
that's what betting companies are doing now, the good ones. Uh, I can't speak for the whole industry. And that is one of the best ways we can mitigate against problem gambling by the identification yeah. through data science. Very it's good. a bit like relying on the barman to tell you you're too pissed, though, isn't it? It's, I don't, I don't find it completely. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's, a, there's, a couple, there's a couple of points. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's just, just a couple of points on that. Um, the, the gross gambling yield, which is the losses that's gone for online, has gone up from about 2.9 billion three or four years ago in the UK to about 4 billion last year. So it's going up. Um, a lot of that is, okay, a portion of that has been substituted online, so online has become more popular, but I think uh, on the whole, the gross gambling yield from the entire industry has gone from about 10 billion five years ago to 14 billion. So that's, it is going up. Um, the, and the, and is that coming the, the, disproportionately for people who can't really afford it? Or? Well, well the, the, this goes back to the, my initial point about what the business models of a lot of these companies, those people, the whole industry, but a lot of these companies, unfortunately, are based on a business model where 15% of their customers are addicted and they're contributing 60% of the gross gambling yield, right? So and on that basis, what can these, co these companies cannot do anything unilaterally that will reduce harm without putting themselves at a competitive disadvantage. Yeah. That's a fact. If they were to actually reduce harm, they would reduce their profits. That is what would happen. And they're not prepared to do that. And that would not be something they can do uh, and you know, tell their shareholders about. By the way, this year, we're going to make less money. Uh, it wouldn't be acceptable. I have to so, object so, no, to that. No, no, but, that, but, that, but, that, but that, is, that, is, that is why you need regulation. And that's, that's the only way you can deal with it. And the, only, the most effective measures for preventing harm have come from outside the industry. Blocking software, um, financial transaction blocking. You know, the industry themselves have not come up with anything that has reduced harm. I don't think. Are they helping they, to support these or, measures? And in, and in order to, sorry? Are they helping to support these measures, or? Yes, they are. Yeah. They're referring. To do, do you not think GamStop is a good idea? It's not perfect. It's um, a good idea, but it has been very badly executed, and it's taken four years to. It has taken too long. It's taken but too yeah. long. These are else, uh, is acknowledged. <laughs> it's, if you exclude yourself from one gambling online gambling operator, you become excluded to the others. Okay. The, the concept that's, that's is good. Concept it has been heavily criticised for not actually being of the quality that it could have been uh, and quickly I think enough. That's right. <laughs> but yes, it's a great idea and needed. Okay, and it's good to see the industry involved. Yeah. We've got loads of hands still going, but let me come to you. So, so if you say your name. Hi, yeah, uh, so it's Tom. So my sort of background is I've uh, been gambling all my life. I used to work in the bookmakers, I've worked in an investment bank, I've worked for a hedge fund. I've, I've, <laughs> I have, when I was in my mid-twenties, I had about 100, 100 betting accounts because I would always look for the best price. I don't think they've really ever made any money me, off me and I, and, I, and I think I can sort of square up a bit of a few points. So the 15%, 60% statistic, the only way that I can, one could sort of fathom that to work is because of the odds that uh, the gambler is betting on are significantly bad basically so they have a really bad they have a really low expected value so they're probably going to be the sort of um bets that you talked about of uh, you know fixed odd terminals where yeah. you know if you go and put in put your pound in a fruit machine your expected value is you lose 28p so it's 28p for a spin so that's the sort of uh, that's the sort of dichotomy of skill versus uh, uh Skill versus luck, which is what I think in the States they had a big court case over to try and differentiate what yeah. constituted gambling. And I think that's why I take that's issue right. with your point, sir, on the fact that everything is gambling. People, people play games. That's our support of our, our life, fun we want to do. I don't think we, we should contaminate it by uh, applying some sort of pejorative, uh, negative... Uh, connotation to it and quite clearly I think everyone always caveats everything on by people will be harmed yes we have to definitely do that so that's why I probably think the sort of solutions that uh, gentleman there has put across of preventing the impulsive ch choice where you're making the decision that you wouldn't make when you had a um, when, in, when you had time to think about it or that is, 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 is a really good way of allowing people to maintain something they clearly really enjoy, but also protect people who are potentially harm harmed. But can I ask you, do, you, do you think it's reasonable to run that kind of twas ever thus argument when it's clear that so much has changed in the last 15 years? So say that again? So you know, you, I mean, part of your argument, this is human nature. We like doing this stuff, we've always liked oh. doing it. 
what I'm saying to you is actually the world has changed in the last 13 years. We're not in the same place as we were in 2004. If you look at the volumes of, of uh, money flowing in, if you look at the prevalence of gambling in, in areas of society where it didn't used to be, if you look at the industries that rely on gambling that didn't used to rely on it, the world has changed, and I wonder whether we don't need to do more well, to keep up with it. Could we equally argue on that basis? Like, let's assume there's a X amount of percentage of negativity attached with that, like there will be with everything. Um, you've also enriched lots of people, made people happy and enjoy themselves, and that's been a, a consequence of that. Is you know that's what happens in uh, as economies are allowed to function and people are allowed to yeah. express themselves. Got a hand over there at the back. Yeah. Yeah, great. Um, no, I was just going to say, I sorry, think... can I get your name as well? Sorry, Simon. Um, Simon Englander. Um, I think <clears> it's just with all these things, it's worth separating out. It's really easy to refer to the kind of whole picture of gambling. And actually, there's, there's ways of separating out. Like, in my view, the fixed odds terminals, I, I kind of can't really believe that they still exist as a thing. Um, they won't after April. <laughs> <laughs> they, you know, I, I think they have huge amounts of um, dangerous capability for drawing people in into these kind of relentless patterns. Whereas as someone, you know, I have gambled in the last six months, but it's part of a match day experience where I think about it in the same way that I would go and get a pint beforehand. It's, it's something I do before the game. I'm not there the whole game thinking, is my bet going to come off? Is my bet going to come off? Mm -hmm. It's just a, if I get anywhere close to the scoreline, I'm happy. And so <laughs> it's, it's just, it's separating out different experiences. And for the vast majority of people, um, I think that gambling is, is a fun kind of semi-social response, not social responsible, but like, it's, it's fine. But I think there is a big, you know, there's a growing segment for whom these terminals represent a real problem. And it's the same online and offline. Okay, Henry, I should uh, come to you. Yes, I, I just wanted to uh, make something clear, just in case there's any doubt. Despite spending my whole working life surrounded by pathological gamblers and their um, suicidal families and the fact that they're all homeless, etc., I do not feel in any way uh, that gambling should be banned. I don't think in any way that gambling should be an enjoyable activity for the majority of the population. I'm... I and many other people in our world are very concerned about making sure that people who are vulnerable, for example, young people with brains that are not fully developed, who may be more impulsive, who may see gambling as a normalised activity through adverts on TV during sports matches, that they get protected. But, you know, what adults do, you know, that, that, that's absolutely fine. And I think when people hear about someone who works in a clinic for pathological gambling, they automatically assume that prohibitionist is, is what, we, what we are aiming for, but it, it isn't at all. And, and I'm much more interested today, for example, in hearing people's opinions about how we reduce harm uh, for our young and for the people who already have the vulnerabilities. Can I just ask you, is there anything medical which, which supports the idea that the changes in the way that gambling is conducted means that we, we're dealing with something different now, more addictive than it used to be? Uh, no, the reward pathways that are dysfunctional are pretty much the same as, as they were from what I can tell. Of course, the imaging work that we're doing now was not done uh, 30 years ago, but people were still presenting. There are plenty of accounts in literature to, you know, people have had problems with gambling forever, uh, and they have always been the minority. You don't have a whole nation who is a problem gambling. You know? so, so I think it's about uh, quantifying the problem, but the severity of the problem, I think, uh, is extreme now, because the immediacy with which we can access our funds, with which we can respond to stimuli, such as, uh, you know, click here and get this and do that, it's all so fast that uh, people who are vulnerable uh, just don't have the skills to protect themselves in a way that they did when they needed to leave the house, tell their wife they were going to the pub, when in fact they were going to the bookmakers, which may have been closed anyway because it was the middle of the night. So it all gets very fast, which is why technology is so important. And by the way, we're talking about gambling, but there are many other activities. Or someone here mentioned gaming. I have several patients who are £40,000, 
£30,000 in debt because they're buying off clothes. Now, where does technology play a part there? That's just a thought I wanted to... OK, I've got, I've got such a queue of people. Let me come to you first. Yeah, Kate. hi, um, Alison Dickinson. I think it's been touched on a few times, but to me there's a massive distinction between what you might perceive as games of skill, like sports betting and like out-and-out -out gambling where you don't know the odds and the chance, perhaps like you've identified with, with FOBTs, and I think any form of regulation should address that. And I think, kind of linked to your point about how technology has enhanced gambling, it's, it's enhanced information as well. So it's made people able to make, in terms of sport betting, more informed decisions. But obviously that hasn't helped in the FOBT world. Yeah, OK. Um, we come to you, so you've okay. had one. Uh, yeah, no, I'd like to add my voice. Sorry, my name's Jonathan Ford. I'd like to add my voice to a very small number of authoritarians around here. <laughs> 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 where we are at present is a sort of normality. Um, but I think if you look back over a lifetime of, uh, not quite my lifetime, but lifetime of some people, um, the, you will find that before 19, when, when we introduced, uh, this was a highly regulated, in fact, almost non-existent industry before the 1950s, beyond uh, off -course, on course book making and the like. And, um, the when we introduced the uh, we introduced the whatever it was the uh, not the national lottery premium bonds in 1955, uh, Hugh Gates will called it a squalid raffle. Uh, <laughs> on co off course bookmaking was introduced from 1960 before that was illegal. We have moved a really long way, and so and and I think my view on the 2005 Act is that I think you have to look at the motivations for the 2005 Act, and I think that the people who framed it and the people who pushed it through Parliament were very focused on the earnings and attracting investment to this industry, which they feared, because of the internet and other devices, might migrate to other places if they made it more <coughs> difficult. They liberalized it very, very dramatically, in my view. And I think we have gone too far, too fast. Um, I think it's quite natural to, I mean, I, I, I wouldn't put myself in the camp of an abolitionist, but it seems to me that the idea that having created this free-for-all, where at the same time, for example, where we have restricted very heavily advertising on things like cigarettes, we have made it unbelievably easy for people to access these things during sports matches and so forth. Um, I think we have got this out of kilter, and I think this idea that somehow, you know, Lazarus-like, we can all heal ourselves by putting a sort of app on our smartphone is unrealistic and I think there has to be more than that to this than just saying people must be allowed, you know, people, we must just rely on people exercising responsible choice. I agree with Matt that responsible gambling, I'm sure it does exist, but I don't think it's as widespread as all that. Okay, thank you. And I, I work with Katie, so I know you can be authoritarian, but maybe not on this. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to bring up Maggie Thatcher, don't you? Um, yeah. So actually, I should say that I'm the daughter of a man who, uh, was a, who owned bingos and amusements arcades. So I grew up with gaming and gambling in my family and in my blood, as it were. And I used to be a bingo caller. That's probably why I'm now ah, working ah. in a startup. <laughs> um, but actually, I was actually intrigued by something you said, which was about it being gene predisposed genetically. Mm. And it made me think that actually, um, am I doing the right thing with my son when actually I gamify his behaviour? And a reward charts something that actually, I mean, this is totally not what all you guys are talking about, which is far more intelligent. But there was just something about this concept of, if it is genetically predisposed, and it is something that you can, um, that, 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 you know, my father was a gambler, and he died actually in poverty because of his gambling issues. So he was a pathological gambler? Yeah, he definitely yeah. was. Yeah. And an alcoholic, yeah. and quite a few other things as well, but they will leave those ones for another thinking. But But I suppose my question is, in the same way that I can test whether I have the, like, uh, breast cancer gene, Right. If I'm sitting there with my son and I'm thinking about gamifying reward charts, I'm thinking about how I reward good behaviour with him, I gamify everything in his life. Mm -hmm. You know, like homework, <laughs> everything like this. You know, it, it's all about trying to get like the reaction I want. But if I'm actually potentially making him worse because he's predisposed to gambling, I'd like to know how well, I find that well, out. That, that, that's a very interesting question. First of all, I would oh, hope that question? you... Sorry, I broke it. Question. Um, well, let, let, let me pick up on this because it's about, you know, what you're not doing is you're not rewarding him sometimes but not others, I hope. 
So if he oh, does so something... No, that's good and bad parenting. Yeah. Let's not go there. Well, it's all about... But that's what gambling is. You don't know when you're going to get your reward, right? So this is what activates okay. this system. So if he does something... If he does his homework and you give him something, that's great. You're enforcing good behaviour. That's nothing to do with gambling. Yeah. However, on a more serious note, there is going to be a risk there for him that is far higher than <coughs> some other people who don't have a grandfather who was a problem gambler. So what I... In, in your position, what I would do is I would speak quite early on with him about the risks that he may in the <coughs> future uh, face when he has to manage his own money. Because what we find is that people uh, don't know about these risks until often they are, for example, at university or in their first job, and the fact of having a certain amount of money triggers uh, the illness, or an early big win, you mentioned yep. it, That's or an early big win by proxy where your best friend wins and it still can right. trigger it. And that's when he, so talking to him about that would be good, or send him to me and I'll have <laughs> Okay. Um, it's so great. It's an agent. Right. I'm going to go <laughs> to the reward. Can I just say, I, I'm keen to pick up on the point that Jonathan made about we've come a long way and mm. is it time to think about whether we've gone too far. So anybody who's got points on that very interested, there's a gentleman at the back who's had his hand up for a long time. I'm Peter Sugarman. I'm a partner of a private equity firm that owns a spread betting company. Uh, spread betting is uh, both an investment tool if used appropriately and a vehicle for gambling if used inappropriately or appropriately if that's what you want to do. But you need to recognise that it is gambling. We have a percentage of clients who lose money consistently and drop out, and they're replaced by other clients who do the same. It's part of the business model. Now, the FCA has regulated us uh, quite stringently and has recently imposed a complete ban on the equivalent of fixed odds betting, which is binary betting, which is uh, a rush, no real way of determining which way the market will move. Uh, and I support that ban, but what we've seen is that those clients just move from a UK regulated entity to an unregulated entity in the BBI or wherever. And I think, therefore, that one of the reasons for the 2005 Act was a recognition that the internet has internationalized the whole world of betting, and if we didn't do something, other people would. And therefore, I feel that the solution, if there is a solution, is a technological one, and in particularly the payment systems. The payment systems are the vehicle for cash to come into the gambling economy, and they can be used intelligently to stop it. Mm. Okay. I'm going to come to Matt, because you wanted to say something, and then Lydia, and then Tessa, and then you, sir. Um, so, in the 2005 Gambling Act, uh, there was no real provision to regulate online. The internet was just getting started. Around the, the Bud Review, which sort of informed the Gambling Act in 2005, was in 2001. The internet was just getting off the, off the ground. Internet gambling wasn't really a thing. Smartphones didn't even exist. So in, in 2014, there was a Remote Gambling Act, uh, which sought to address uh, this, um, the absence of any kind of re uh, legislation related to online. And, a lot of the suggestions, the amendments that were put forward did look at things like payment blocking and it did look at things like internet service provider blocking for sites that weren't licensed or regulated by the Gambling Commission and unfortunately there weren't accepted uh, amendments so all they, the, only, the only way that they sort of regulate, uh, they prevent sites that aren't regulated by or licensed by the Gambling Commission operating here or accessing the British market is by saying if you're not licensed you can't advertise. So it just, just uses the kind of advertising as the leverage. I mean, it's, it, it's not good enough. It, it should be, it, there should be much more. That the, I agree. What would more be? As, as, as this gentleman said, payment blocking, yeah. ISP blocking. Yep. I mean, there's lots of things you could do to prevent these sites accessing this market. And, and why on earth would you... I mean, I, I would go one step further. I would say if they want to operate here, they should be based here and they should pay corporation tax here. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, right. they, I mean I why on earth? The point I was going to make, Kerry, is that the, the, there's almost a, been a completely contradictory attitude mm -hmm. in, in terms of the UK government towards, you know, post-2005 to 
to open the market up and then frankly just give away yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. any control or access for operate. You know, yeah. when I was at Betfair before we floated, we stayed as a UK based company because we felt that was the right thing to do. Mm. We wanted Scribe. to make our contribution, mm. yeah. Mm. When we floated and we went to, you know, we have numerous I'm sure we've had the same conversation saying, listen, it is it is absolutely we cannot look our shareholders in the eye and piss away twenty five million of our bottom line. They just won't tolerate it. Unless you change, we will have to go. And you know, it was literally to the point where we're going. No, we're really going. And and we wanted to stay, we wanted to be a UK company, but we couldn't operate as a public company with shareholders of money in that way. And the the lack of the, the backbone that the government's had to implement a proper license to operate system is 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 really ceding so much control over the industry and so much ability to engage and have companies who are vested have a vested interest in being successful and being good operators in this country. Yeah. Okay. And, and the revenues that the revenues, <laughs> the revenues the government is missing out. Oh, I wanted to hear from some other people. Sorry. Research, yeah. education, and treatment. I want to come to Lydia and then you should, and then right in the back corner as well, please. So, Lydia first. I think that successive governments and the regulator have been far too lax. And I think about what the Gambling Commission claims that it does, claims that it does, and it's to, that's to regulate safe, fair, and open gambling. And just think about some of the things that you could improve straight away. We've already touched on some of them in the room. Um, using credit cards to gamble, why is that still enabled? Being able to, to block banks, you've talked about. Removing, actively removing licences from companies who don't use the technology properly or fail to intervene in shops when they see so, some problems. Massively reducing the, the ability to be able to advertise. So those are the things that you could do to make gambling safer. In terms of trying to make it more open, the terms and conditions that are on many, many gambling websites are just so opaque and it gives uh, the operator an inexhaustible number of ways in which they win and the customer loses. I think t terms and conditions need to be clearer, fairer and in plain English. And finally, fair. Um, I think that people who win, sh who, who have some skill, should be enabled to win. Um, I think advertising should be fairer, or at least win a, win, a, win a fair amount, because at the moment you have a system whereby not only are um, a, a, a people fueling large losses who are problem gamblers, you have the people who, are, who might potentially make some sort of a profit being uh, restricted in terms of their stake or shut down. And uh, my final point on that would be, I feel that if um, many betting companies uh, put as much effort into tracking uh, uh, some of their customers who are likely to do them a little bit of damage as they do towards, uh, if they put as much uh, effort into that as they into problem gambling, then we wouldn't have this problem to such a degree that we do. Mm. Okay, um, you sir. Hi. Can, can we, on your timeline, can we have at least two minutes on societies being addicted as well as addicted <coughs> as individuals? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Watch the tortoise. Mm, yeah. I'm, I'm Simon. I work. I'm a, actually a, a law, uh, we work in a law firm, and we represent a lot of um, gambling companies. And I'd actually like to do something unusual for a lawyer in my position, which is um, defend the gambling commission. Because actually, I think if you look at their behaviour over the last two years, mm -hmm. they're increasingly going into companies, they're increasingly telling companies that they've got to use these tools, they've got to use this data. They do regulate the industry. They are getting a lot of tax out the industry. Well, the Treasury is getting a lot of tax out the industry in terms of it's increasing remote gaming duty to 21%. It's increased. Uh, you, know, you have to pay tax. You have to have a license here. You have to comply with the standards of the Gambling Commission. You have to comply with their license conditions. The CMA did a review last year uh, into the terms and conditions of gambling companies and insisted that they be become fair and be written in plain English. And there have been a lot of changes in the industry since then. So I think. We shouldn't let the fact that fog teas are a, an ill, that were an unintended consequence of the Gambling Act 2005, um, and you know clearly were wrong. And you know congratulations, Matt, for making these changes. But we shouldn't denigrate the online industry, and in particular, we shouldn't denigrate you know, the majority of operators who are taking this forward and moving forward, and the Gambling Commission, which is actually pushing them to do something. Yeah. I support that actually. I think the Gambling Commission in the last three years have done an enormous yeah. amount of Agreed. positive things and I am full of admiration for them. It's but sadly fun. Sarah Harrison has left now, so they're living on past glories. Okay, let me come to the to back there. Um, my name is Charlotte. Um, my observation is that we spend we spend a lot of time in this conversation discussing the use of tech, rightly. I think it is obviously doing phenomenal good. But it's very interesting we haven't discussed the 
very high prevalence of advertising and the draw that brings in and the enabling that that brings in, particularly at a very young age, um, where we know that that rush has become much more addictive at a younger age and it obviously plays through to later habits. And I think surely even if you could leave much of the industry as the same, um, you, you have to tackle the use of advertising and essentially what I'm hearing is that advertising has almost been used as a regulatory model um, within the UK to some extent of saying what well, if you know if you want to work in the UK you can advertise that that is the wrong way around yeah. for this industry right. it has to be cracked out. Could, could I just add to your point that um, the industry has um, elected to stop TV advertising between whistle to whistle uh, as of July of this year so that's that's the industry that is, but that's a relatively small proportion of their spend isn't it uh, no. It is. 50% of TV spend. It's about 15% of their overall spend, isn't it? 50%. You should look at the, the, the problem that, you know, people, the complaints are around, you know, kids seeing that advertising during football. You shouldn't look at it as a percentage of the spend. You should look at it who's watching it. Well, I think it's worth saying most of the, most of the advertising is done online. That's where the majority of the spend is. Because kids can have access to TV that still makes a big proportion. It's a, yeah. big, it's a big move by the industry. It's the right move. And it is an example of the industry alongside... The Gambling Commission making yeah. the right steps. Okay, um, where was I going? Uh, I was going to use Stuart, yes. Yeah, I'll be quick. Uh, so I just wanted to, I thought both excellent points, and the lady at the front, I thought I agree with everything she said, and I just wanted to quickly touch on why I think regulation is so important and uh, legislation, and that's because if you're going to be realistic, an industry is often only as good as the worst people in it. Like, we have to be realistic, these companies all have shareholders to report to, and the company goals and everything will all be about making as much money as possible. If you think, oh, I don't think we should be advertising with Ray Winston every single football game <laughs> and annoying everybody, then and you stop doing that, then that affects how many people come to your website. If everyone else is still doing that, you put a commercial disadvantage. And that's why I feel like sometimes the regulation just, or legislation just has to be the thing that steps in and just sets the level yeah. that everyone has, everyone's at and it makes it kind of a fair game across the piece. Yeah, you said that. This may be verging onto the next topic or a topic for another thing, Kim, but we talk about sort of fixed odds terminal betting that's a certain type of um, uh, feed even addiction. But the parallel between that and gaming that this gentleman talked about, and you must see that 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 we may be creating, and this goes to the, the society conversation, you know, we talk about the people's parents and grandparents, etc. Is that because they were exposed to it or because they're genetically disposed to it? I think there's a large element because they're exposed to it. The gaming that's in front of our kids now and how they're programmed to give them that instant feeling of bits of success, failure, bits of success, failure, etc. Exactly what the fixed odd terminal betting are doing. I think that that is a, you know, if we talk about gambling the regulation, the gaming industry globally, whether it's something as innocuous as Candy Crush or something more serious as having to buy add-ons in games, I think that has got a bigger psychological impact and is making it ingrained in a much younger, more um, vulnerable part of society. Okay, well you mentioned society and John, so there's your cue. <laughs> Sorry, it's just that quite right that you can understand how the conversation focuses on the individual harm exactly the same as Instagram with children being bullied or whatever. But you have to take up the backdrop of it, where when you sort of like try and take a step back, if it, when did we as a whole society become addicted so that we can see that the Olympics wouldn't have happened without the lottery, or you can see the individual cities now having lotteries to fund things, where you can see you can go online with things called the health lottery. Gee, God, we're ready to start on that one. Yeah. And then you go to whole cities around the world, whether it was starting from Macau to Singapore, where you see the whole business model of the cruise lines now being, they don't want you to go out and enjoy just going on a ship, they want you to be in game, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. <coughs> we're, we're seeing as a backdrop where gaming slash gambling has become a norm. So that your loyalty to your football club when you turn up and it's closed Wi-Fi syndrome, you almost feel disloyal if you don't put a bet on. We're going, when you, put, you go to the DVLA to pay for your driving licence and you get a, you're enter for a draw for a car. The gaming, the gambling, um, Camelot uh, did a survey about two years ago asking people to estimate how many times they'd be asked to game or gamble in a 24-hour period. They said how much it was. And they underestimated you by about 2,000% in how many times you get asked for information. Look, watch this TV program, press A, B, C. You can look at the individual 
uh, addiction, but it's against the backdrop that a society. When do Bet365 run out with t-shirts for, or their gaming shirts for their football club that said drink 365 or smoke hashish 365 or whatever? You can't, it's just become the law. So you can go for the individual, most of the models we're looking at for gaming addiction as a clinical psychologist focus on the individual. When do we look at society? Okay, the tortoise has got her skates on, so keep an eye on her. Um, I'll just make one observation, which is it's very interesting that while most of the voices around the room are very much in favour of people solving their own problems, i.e. the individual gambler taking action, all the industry voices effectively want external action to be taken on them. They don't want to be based in the UK unless they're forced to, and they don't want, they want in ad advertising bans because they can't be relied upon to act <coughs> on their own initiative because it will put them at a disadvantage. And you can, so you can sort of see there's a distinction between this idea that the problem can be solved at the individual level, but industry finds it difficult to, to respond at the collective level. One simple thing. I mean, you know, you couldn't have walked into that bookies on the high street if it were account-based with ID yeah. at right. 60 yeah. And one of the simplest things we should do is make all gambling account based. I, I fully agree with you, I mean, but every time I suggest yeah. it, I am told that this is really not acceptable because yeah, it's a land state. I, I think it would be very simple. They, they, I mean, I go back yeah. to my blockbuster analogy. You could not rent a deal. If it's illegal, then you can do it. it. Why not do is it? The, yeah. Is the industry pressing with one voice for that to happen? Well, I come from a particular point of view because, obviously, having been at Betfair, which was online and account based, um, you know, that's we were only ever online. We never Trump, we never moved from the high street to, to online. Yeah. So we were always at an advantage in okay. terms of managing. I just want to come to this thing. Yes, you sir. So I also have a bit of an interest. I was an investor in Skybet alongside okay. Rob and, and the team. I'm Let's no, get your no name as well. Involved, uh, Pev Hooper. I think isn't that the job though of, of regulators to be able to step back and and look at some of this stuff holistically? and then decide on the right balance between the individual, the industry, which, by the way, isn't, isn't a collective, because I think you have people with all sorts of different structures and motivations and, frankly, levels of ethics. Yeah. And I think an awful lot of the people who are at the more responsible end would welcome some action yeah. being taken here, because it's quite hard to be a lone actor and then find that there's, you know, the lowest common denominator behaviour is what's dragging perception down and, frankly, providing you know, the outlet for, for people who want to, to pursue this rather than you know, working with you to do proper cross-industry self-exclusion. So I think, it, I think it has to be holistic. I think you can't ban things because we've seen prohibition and the rest drives it underground. I think it's got to be the individual, it's got to be the whole ecosystem, Credit cards, payment yeah. systems, yeah. Yeah. you know, the great work that you're doing. Henry, to quickly, sorry. Yes, what? so one very short thing that happened last week, and I, I fully agree with you, I think that's right, that's what's needed. <coughs> um, a 20 year old came to see me with his mother. In the 12 hours before he came to see me, he had spent £150,000, which he didn't. Um, when I inquired how he'd managed to do that with his parents next door asleep, he said that he didn't have any savings. He was feeling depressed. He went online to gamble. Uh, he was told his card wasn't working anymore. So he went on PayPal and took out 2,000, 2,000, 2,000 until he'd racked up 150. So, you know, we can do so much more uh, to protect people. And I think that's a really, you know, I, I needed to bring you this story because it's fresh with me and I'm very upset about it. If anyone is here from PayPal, talk to me. Because this is, this, is where, this is where, for example, even the credit card ban as it wouldn't cover the e-wallets like PayPal. Fair enough. Because PayPal, it's a 48 hours, I think, yeah. uh, before it gets taken out of your bank. So there's a loophole that so it has to be holistic when <laughs> all these sectors working together, yeah. OK. I think I want to return to where you started with cannabis and link it back to the conclusions from that thinking, which I think were we should move slowly towards legalisation but keep a very clear view on the impact. So Canada has met first. Mm -hmm. Lucky us to be able to watch what unfolds in Canada and the psychologists do the work. We leapt first on this as the UK, and we leapt at a very unfortunate time before 
the other thinking on smartphones, you know, the, the gambling yield's gone up since 2012, which is when the smartphones yeah. penetrated. So, yeah. and the 2014 review would have been consulted on in 12 and 13 before smartphones. Mm -hmm. So we're in a position where we've let first, and we're not taking the time to learn and catch up and close new polls and regulate, whereas the rest of the world may be looking at us going, there are the mistakes made, yes, what can we learn from them? So I think, unlike cannabis where we can watch and observe, we are, we are the test we patient here, and we're not taking enough action to remedy. Okay, um, anybody want to make a final point before the tortoise reaches? One very quick point, Lydia, just, about, just about the, the Gambling Commission. I definitely agree that the Gambling Commission have made great strides in the last two or three years. I think the driving force is at the head of that, so Harrison has now left. I'm more suspicious about where they are going now and whether they just want to appear to be doing the right thing rather than actually doing the right thing. And I think it frankly just comes down to knowledge. I just don't think that they have the knowledge to understand the realities of what happens when problem gamblers um, are... Um, enticed into losing more and more money. Okay, I'm going to ignore the flag and just take I one final point there. Just a quick point. To, I think it's something to, to the lady at the front said, but it just reminded me. So when I, when I was 19, I worked at Coral. It was before it was, <laughs> the internet just started. Um, but we had a uh, system where if we had anyone that was particularly successful, we had to document their success, their features, what they were like. So we, but, so the so the in, the industry had actually. Uh, Done, it, done its, tried to do its due diligence on looking at people's pers characteristics, but it did it with a view of protecting themselves. Yeah. 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 Well, that's exactly. right, yeah. Rather than the, you know, rather than protecting the individual. So yeah. it has the, you know, it's got the means and the sort of eyes and the idea to do it. So perhaps, you know, but uh, you know, as I think we've sort of readily acknowledged, there is a direct conflict of interest because. Uh, it's almost a zero-sum game, yeah. so that's why it's tricky, which is why you do need outside help to, to, to bring it in. Okay, um, listen, thank you ever so much. Um, we have got to the end, and some of you will know who've been to one of these things before. It now falls to me to try to pick the bones out of that, as they say, or summarise what, um, what we've talked about. The, the point of these things is to try to help us reach an informed point of view about... Um, about gambling, about regulation, about the, the, all the stuff that we've discussed. Um, I think what I say in the next 30 seconds is unlikely to be the finished article, but it's given us a great, great starting point. I'd actually start, I think, with something you said near the end, that that, that, that story about a 20-year-old managing to access £150,000 in next to no time um, and uh, what that will do to his life and the life of people around him. Um, you can't look at that and think that this great experiment that you talked about is going brilliantly in every way, because clearly there are, there are still holes in it. I, I started off by early on saying there was, a, we, there was a sort of two tracks we were talking about. There was the technological solutions to a, to a problem that's been abetted by technology, or there was a sort of regulatory track. I think where we've got to is, is both and rather than either or, that actually I think um, we have come a long way and, and it is worth us looking back on this experiment and saying, how's that gone for us? Um, so I think we don't want to lose sight of the regulation and the legislation. And I think, Lydia, you offered us a menu of things that seem sensible. Uh, you know, there, was, there were nods all around the room at the idea that it's foolish to allow credit cards to be used for gambling. I think um, I took your point, Peter, about the difficulties of, of regulating within one country in a world that's as connected as this, but nevertheless, I think we ended up with a bunch of buttons we could press uh, and, and that we would want to. Um, and I understood you know, your point, Tessa, about the pressure that companies are under um, if, if we want them to remain within this country, then th th they need a measure of... of protection from the environment that can can be that part of the licensing yeah that can be part of the licensing arrangements so I think um, we don't want to we're going to lose sight of regulation and we don't want to think that the ship has sailed but at the same time I think that some of the technological solutions are hugely impressive um, and, and we will want to endorse the work that Monzo is doing we want to endorse the kind of work that you're you're involved in as well. So, so I think where we'll go is that the, you know, the room has been clear. There is, there is a real fascinating, difficult problem here. Um, 
that impacts lives that you see every day, um, and that we will we will try to work out what the best legislative course is, whilst putting our hands up for you know, the people who are already doing great work on the on the technical side. So listen, thank you all very much for coming. It's been really fascinating, really lively, and I hope you'll um, come and join us again. Thank you. Thank you so much.